Hi everybody, I'm Jack Forrester and welcome to another episode of... Has that plan always been there? Hi everybody, I'm Jack Forster, Editor-in-Chief at Hodinkee, and this is not a previously unseen episode of Jack Forster and the Winter Soldier. We've got a really great episode coming up for you, a lot of really interesting questions, including someone who wants to know what the heck the deal is with odd-numbered lug widths. Stay tuned. What's the difference between a pilot watch and a field watch? The difference between a pilot's watch and a field watch is that one of them is worn by a pilot, and the other one is worn in the field. It can be any kind of field. Cornfield, a wheat field. First glance, a pilot's watch and a field watch, they look virtually identical, and that's because they both kind of have the same functionality brief. They're both designed to be rugged, and they need to be legible. So you will often see very, very simple dials, a copious use of black and white as contrasts, you know, simplicity in design. These are not ornaments. These are both watches. Pilot's watches and field watches are both designed to be used. It's nice to know that a watch can perform in the environment that it was originally intended to perform in. We still want that out of our uh, tool watches. Where they differ historically is that pilot's watches usually have some greater degree of accuracy because uh, you know, in the pre-GPS days, especially if you were making a pilot's watch for, for the navigator, you would need something accurate enough and precise enough that you could use it for dead reckoning, that you could use it for other navigational calculations. The other thing that you might not realize, airplane engines generate pretty strong magnetic fields. And uh, especially if you're flying something like, um, I don't know, a single engine fighter aircraft, you know, sometime in the World War II era, there's a pretty strong magnetic field coming from the mechanism inside the engine. There are actually pilot's manuals from that period that talk about how to manage those magnetic fields and how to compensate for their effects on wristwatches. So pilot's watches will often have some degree of anti-magnetic protection. The classic way to do that is to have what's called a soft iron dial and a soft iron inner case. And uh, what these materials do is uh, they provide what's called a preferred pathway for magnetic fields. So when a magnetic field line hits the watch, instead of it going through the balance spring and screwing up your accuracy and precision, it flows through the dial and through the uh, soft iron inner case, and uh, the watch will continue to operate as you expect it to. And I think that's the single biggest difference between pilot's watches traditionally and uh, field watches. Hey Hodinkee, what is up with odd numbered lug widths? Some watches have 19 millimeters or 21 millimeter widths, which make it hard to buy straps. And don't get me started on buying bracelets at those sizes. You know, there's a, an old Star Trek original series episode in which uh, science officer Spock is wearing his dress uniform. I know now the great joy you felt when you joined minds with colors. I rejoice in your knowledge and in your achievement. And he has a Vulcan emblem on it called the IDIC, I-D-I-C emblem. And IDIC stands for infinite diversity in infinite combinations. Let us not despair at odd numbered lug widths. Let us rather celebrate the diversity that they offer us, the choice that they give us. I mean, honestly, I think it, it actually has to do with uh, design considerations. You know, the width of the lugs kind of changes how the lugs themselves relate to the case and how the case relates to, uh, you know, the dial furniture. So part of an overall design choice that the designers make when they design a watch. They're, they're not doing it to aggravate people who have something against uh, odd numbers for some reason. Assuming normal maintenance, does a watch mainspring lose uncoiling power after several decades and need to be replaced in order to provide consistent force? Or does it work indefinitely? I think that at this point, lots of us know what it's like to work under constant tension, which is uh, kind of what a mainspring has to do any metal alloy, if you keep it under constant tension and if it keeps uh, flexing and unflexing and flexing and unflexing, which is what a mainspring does, eventually a phenomenon called metal fatigue is going to occur. And it doesn't really matter what the alloy is. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. In the old days, mainsprings were made out of blued, tempered steel, plain steel. This would happen relatively quickly. Two years and the mainspring would basically need to be replaced. Nowadays, you can get a much, much longer service span out of a modern alloy mainspring. And the other advantage of modern alloy mainsprings is that they deliver an almost exactly even delivery of power over the entire running time of the watch. So you don't see this dramatic, dramatic drop off in balance amplitude as the watch starts to wind down. I mean, that does happen, but only at the very, very, very end of the power reserve. It varies with the watch. It varies with the size of the mainspring. Sooner or later, uh, every mainspring is gonna fatigue and every mainspring is gonna have to be replaced. 
Hey, Hodinkee, what are, in your opinion, the most and the least successful watch collaborations? For example, Breitling for Bentley, Panerai and Ferrari, AP and Marvel. Brands do collaborations all the time. We've all seen them. And uh, there is a little bit of a tendency for purists to kind of roll their eyes when they see a brand collaboration. And, you know, part of the time it's just because we're ideologically opposed to the idea of changing a watch design because of a partnership with an external brand, car company or a whiskey company or what have you. But I think part of the reason is because a lot of the time they feel a little perfunctory. You know, I mean, a collaboration isn't really a successful collaboration just because you take an existing watch and put another company's logo on the dial. I mean, it actually detracts from the design. Uh, it makes the whole watch suddenly look a little bit frivolous and a little bit like you're looking at a billboard instead of a fine wristwatch. You know what really drives me nuts? When somebody does an automotive themed watch and they're like, look, carbon fiber, it's used in Formula One cars. Formula One cars use carbon fiber, so we're gonna put carbon fiber on our watch or in our watch or behind our watch or on the strap. And we're gonna make the pushers for the chronograph look like accelerator pedals. I mean, okay, you know, it's, uh, it, it's I, I guess it's fun, um, but it just, it feels a little bit surfacy. And uh, to me, a collaboration works best when it really goes to the very heart of the shared values of both the brand, the watch brand itself, and the partner brand. And this is difficult to do. It requires the kind of deep introspection, soul searching, and indeed spiritual journey that we find in uh, the Space Jam watches. This is the end of this episode, my friend. So don't forget to like and subscribe.